Uh, Charlie is the director of Baylor University's Mayborn Museum Complex. Uh, Charlie, you have decades and decades worth of experience working in you know different museums and in different leadership roles. And I know you're really passionate about this particular exhibit and I'll uh, hand it over to you to take us away in, in today's event. Greatly appreciate that, Ryan. And you're absolutely right. I, I love talking about dinosaurs. Um, uh, and I'm really appreciative to all of you for being here today to learn more about our latest exhibit. Uh, before I forget to say it, this exhibit will be at the Mayborn Museum until September the 26th. And if any of you have time to come by the museum to see it, please ask for me. And if I'm available, I'll come out to greet you and show you the exhibit myself. I really appreciate your interest. Uh, I too would like to thank Ryan, Tess, and Kyle uh, the people behind the scenes that make all this work so effortless, effortlessly. Uh, it is Friday the 13th, so we can expect some kind of glitch, right? Uh, but I think Kyle and Tess uh, and Ryan have taken care of all that. So um, yes, I have been in the museum business for 30 plus years, actually 35 years now. Uh, I have to say I am not a paleontologist. Uh, I've told young people sometimes what I do is harder. I have to manage paleontologists as a museum director. Um, and it has really been one of my great joys to be out in the field, learning about the work they do and discovering dinosaurs. I've had the opportunity to be on some digs and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so my background, again, 35 years in museums. I've been here at Baylor University's Mayborn Museum for almost six years now. Uh, before that, I held positions as director of the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science, wonderful dinosaur country across New Mexico. And I spent 25 years at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, uh, where we were involved with a number of excavations in Texas. And again, I'll mention those later. Uh, I spent a little bit of time in San Antonio. I had the opportunity to, to open the brand new children's museum in San Antonio called the Duseum. And I really recommend all of those institutions if you like dinosaurs and if you like uh, museums. So today we're gonna talk about the world's largest dinosaurs. Um, they're the long neck sauropods that you see behind me here, these long neck sauropods. Uh, they were named sauropods as a group of animals back in the late 1800s, so it goes back that long. And sauropod actually means lizard foot. I'm not sure how they got that, but that's what they call them. Uh, this group of animals has these long necks and little bitty heads. Uh, and they're very iconic. So the museum, the exhibit we're gonna talk about today is from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And they have arguably one of the world's uh, best collections, most complete collections of dinosaur fossils. And we had the opportunity to bring this exhibit to Waco and to Baylor University, which is part of our job. We try to bring things that will really add something to the community, something you've never seen before. And, and absolutely, this exhibit contains a lot of those things. Uh, I'll mention, and we'll meet him later, uh, Mark Norell is the curator and the head of paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History. We have a video clip from Mark. He couldn't be here today. Uh, but a video clip from him. And he was the main curator who worked on this exhibition. He worked uh, with a gentleman named uh, Martin Sanders, who was a co-curator. And they really brought an interdisciplinary team together because what they wanted to do is present an exhibit about uh, these dinosaurs, but not just say, wow, weren't they big? They wanted to say, no, no. How did this animal live? How can you live when you're so huge, so gargantuan? How did it have young? How did it breathe? How did it, uh, how did it take in food? Uh, and so the exhibit will take us through step by step some of those processes, and you'll see some pretty amazing fossils and uh, a wonderful recreation of one of these dinosaurs along the way. Um, I'll mention that when it came to us here at Baylor, uh, you wonder how do you put the exhibit uh, the world's largest dinosaurs together. Well, guess what? It showed up in seven 18 wheeler trucks. <laughs> so we had seven trucks to unload, seven trucks worth of crates crowding our hallways. Uh, it took about three weeks for our staff to unload and put it together. A number of staff flew down from the American Museum of Natural History to help manage that process. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, the exhibit will be here through uh, September 26th is the last day, so please do come and, and see it. Um, 
So uh, without further ado, what we're gonna do is, is have Kyle queue up a walkthrough and I'm gonna kind of talk through this walkthrough. If I do not touch on something that you're curious about, put that in the chat and Ryan will ask me during the question and answer. So here's the world's largest dinosaurs. So as you, as you enter the exhibit, you'll see this giant dinosaur peeking out of the wall here. It's a giant Argentinus tinianosaurus, uh, and uh, massive dinosaurs found in Argentina. And again, these were large, large animals, long necks. You can see here on the right, they uh, could be up to 150 feet long, I believe. And uh, they were on the earth for millions and millions of years. Uh, how did an animal like this even walk? Look at that, how long with the neck and the legs? Well, one of the most important things, of course, is breathing for every any animal. And it actually dissects and shows you what a breathing apparatus could be like. We don't know for sure because a lot of this was not fossilized. The only clues we have is what was fossilized and what we can find in the fossil record. But through different interdisciplinary branches of science, in this case biology, uh, we can we can make some guesses and one of the keys about these dinosaurs when we study them is we say hey the present is the key to the past the present is the key to the past how do big animals today live so here is the other side this is Mementosaurus this is the big dinosaur you'll see in the exhibition uh, and you'll learn more about how it works you'll learn about these little teeth uh, this shows a horse tooth on the right and a diplodocus skull on the left, I'm sorry, a horse skull on the right, Diplodocus on the left, and it talks about how they ate. You can see right here on Diplodocus, it has the little teeth up front. Well, a horse has little teeth up front, but it also has the grinding teeth in the back. One way this animal survived is it didn't take time chewing. You can see the horse teeth, the molars on top there. This animal just grabbed food and swallowed, grabbed food and swallowed, grabbed food and swallowed. It did not have time to chew. It had to keep those calories coming in to support that big, big body. Here's a little bit about the skin of these animals. Some skin has been fossilized. So we do know sometimes from the fossil record that uh, we can see skin. Uh, this particular thing is called an oste uh, osteoderm. It was found in 1922. It's a, it's a, it's a, a big scale that sat somewhere on this animal. Maybe it was armor, maybe it was in an elbow pad. We don't know, but an osteoderm was one thing that was uh, that was fossilized. And then here's a neck bone and you say, wow, those animals had their necks way, way out there. How did they do it? One way is because their necks had these air cavities in them and these air cavities made the neck bones, the neck vertebrae lighter. And in one case, I know they were called pleuroceles. And we'll talk about a Texas animal that was actually called pleurocelis. Did their necks go straight up or straight out? We're not sure. Uh, this part of the exhibit, you can actually pick up on the right uh, a cast of a, a vertebrae of one of the sauropods, long neck sauropod. So you can pick it up on the right. And on the left is an actual vertebrae of a giraffe. And you can feel the weight uh, of each of these and see, well, the dinosaur's vertebrae was a lot longer. Well, guess what? It, it is lighter. And that structural lightness helped it uh, to survive. There's wonderful murals in the exhibit. So you get a sense of the breadth of these animals and how big, how big they could be. Uh, they talk about brain size. It turns out that animals that eat only plants in general have smaller brains. Meat eaters have larger brains. And this shows you how much food one of these animals had to eat per day. So per day, they had to wolf down that, that much vegetation to help. So how big were they? This is a backbone of vertebrae from Argentin Argentiniosaurus, which we saw earlier. Behind it is a vertebrae they had in science, but they lost it. They don't know where it went. So we know there's even bigger animals out there. Uh, big animals have slower heart rates because guess what? It takes a lot longer for the blood to fill the chamber. So humans are about 72 beats a second. Elephants are 32. We're not sure what the big animals were. Here are the eggs of a big sauropod. And the eggs were grapefruit size or less. And they laid eggs many times, many, many eggs 
numerous times per year. So it's almost like a frog where they laid eggs everywhere. The second egg from your left is a sauropod egg. They're not that big, but they would lay many, 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 many eggs. And then they'd walk away. The little guys would hatch and they were on their own. And not many of them did survive, but they did this so much uh, that the animals stayed on this earth for millions and millions of years. This part of the exhibit shows lots of the different kinds of sauropods. And one of these is from Texas, and I'll show you it a little bit later. So I won't tell you which one now, you'll have to guess, but there's a, there's a, a lot of different ones. And this is how we, uh, science will tell you how big these animals were. Remember earlier, I told you the present is the key to the past. Well, we know a dog's vertebra or a dog's femur bone, that was a femur bone. It's so much around. If it's that much diameter and a dog's this big, well, if a dinosaur is that much bigger around, it must be that much bigger. So there's actually formulas, mathematical formulas they used to help tell how big these animals were. So of course that's the femur, then coming down to the tibia fibula, that's just the leg bone of one of these large, large animals. You can compare it to humans. There's a hummingbird leg bone in the exhibit and you just marvel at the diversity of life. So that's a very quick walk through of the world's largest dinosaurs. Uh, again, uh, an amazing group of animals. They were on the earth uh, roughly 140 million years. We do have them in Texas. We have different species throughout the United States, numerous species uh, and um, uh, uh, just amazing animals. So we're gonna do just for a little interaction here, I'm gonna ask you a question. And if you have a guess as to the answer of this question, put it in the chat. And then Ryan's going to tell us what kind of answers uh, came out. So here's the question. Mementosaurus, which was that long dinosaur in the exhibit, its hatchlings were how many times smaller than their parents? So that big full body dinosaur you saw in the exhibit, it's young when they hatched. How many times smaller were they than their parents? We're going to give you just... 30 seconds here to put a number uh, in the chat. Don't worry about it. We're not going to call you out, <laughs> but please uh, let us know what you think. How much smaller were these guys than their parents? What's, what's funny is, as I'm looking at these answers rolling in, they're uh, maybe conveniently getting bigger and bigger. Not that anybody would know, you know what, what others are answering, but we had someone that started with uh, 10 times as, as big, the full grown is 10 times as big as the young. Then we had a, a hundred times as big, a 500 times as big. And then even one, uh, one attendee, Charlie, who says probably in the thousands of, of times as big. And I know that you'll probably shock our guests a little bit with, with the answer to this one. I will try. Uh, yes, the answer is 10,000 times bigger than their babies. The adult is 10,000 times bigger than their young. So what an amazing animal to start off so small and to grow so big. So, uh, so that's it. Uh, so to let you know a little bit more about it, what we wanted to do now is take you to a pre-recording -pre of Dr. Norell. And again, Mark is the head of paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History. He travels the world doing this work. I, I worked with him very briefly on uh, the very first exhibit called Dinosaurs of Jurassic Park, uh, which we toured and it came to the museum I was at at the time in Fort Worth. So let's now take a quick tour of what they call the Big Bone Room at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Mark Norell, and I'm chairman of the Division of Paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History. We have arguably the largest collection and most important collection of dinosaurs in the world. So what we're going to go see today is what we call the Big Bone Room, which is on, in the basement of the, of the museum. And it's called the Big Bone Room because it's where some of our largest and most heaviest specimens are. So that, uh, and a lot of these specimens you know, are things, again, that were collected in the later part of the 19th century up through the 19 teens, 20s, mostly pre-war kinds of things. When we find fossils, everybody always asks us, the most common question is, how do you know where to dig? 
we never just start digging randomly because fossils are too rare. So you walk a lot through the desert and that kind of thing or wherever you are and you look for little scraps and pieces of bones either coming out of a hillside or on the ground. And then you do some exploratory little like, you know, digging around and just finding out what the limits is. And then if it looks like it's something really good, then we decided to do a big excavation project. So when we do a ex big excavation project, the first thing we do is to try to put the specimen up on a pedestal and just delimit how big the entire thing is. And then after we get that done, then we start going with using a combination of plaster of Paris and burlap to make these things that we call jackets on top of them. And that's the way that we get them home. And then they come here and then they go up to the prep lab, which is on the eighth floor. And we have a whole group of technicians up there who then remove the, the specimens from the matrix that they're in, so the, the bones from the rock themselves. And so eventually they'll look like some of these things, you know, but it's a very painstaking process. I mean, single specimens can take, you know, years to prepare in some cases. That skull is crazy. Yeah, that's all fake. Oh. I mean, one of the big problems with these bones is they're really heavy and they're really fragile. And so that's really been an impediment for people doing scientific research on them through the years. So a way around that with new technology is to be able to laser surface scan these things and then to be able to either like look at them virtually, like on a computer screen, or to rapid prototype them, either at full size or in some smaller size. And I think that in the next decade, certainly that's the, we're going to learn a lot more about these really giant dinosaurs because of that. Because where I can look like at a little Velociraptor vertebrae and it's only like this big on my desk, this would take me like an hour to get it up to my office, and then it would take two of us just to like rotate it around to look at the different parts of it and stuff. So that, uh, it's, it's, it's tough working on these big animals, but I think technology will supersede that. We have, you have, people have a very distorted idea about how big dinosaurs were. Oh, yeah. I mean, that. And that's mostly just because back in the early days of museums, they just collected the big ones for display. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's just as many small ones. And these are like uh, mini jackhammers. Oh, God. Jurassic Park, I mean, that was so funny when that movie came out because, like, I don't know if it's, if it's true or what it's apoc or if it's some apocryphal story, but apparently, like, you know, they did Velociraptor because they liked the name. And then when the, they showed Spielberg how big it was, he was so disappointed because it was only this long. Yeah. <laughs> so they had to go bigger. Great. Well, that's a glimpse into the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, you know, he pointed out those big uh, blocks there that look like plaster. Uh, and it's interesting when you're out in the field and you find one of these bones, you literally treat it like a broken arm, like a, a doctor puts an, a cast on your arm to keep it still. Well, out in the field, we'll cover these, we'll dig around carefully, cover them with plaster. It sets really hard and then you can move it. And when you get it back to the lab, then you very carefully uncover it and take it apart. And you heard him say it could take years to prepare one of these specimens. Uh, when I was in New Mexico, some of my volunteers were former physicians and even surgeons and they had very steady hands. And the head paleontologist there said, I can't do this work, it's so fine. But these volunteers would painstakingly take off grains of sand, grains, 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 to slowly open up one of these jackets and reveal this gorgeous dinosaur or dinosaur bone. And to me, it was like having a Christmas present that takes two years to open because it's like this anticipation. What's it going to be? What's going to be there? And you just keep working on it. So um, so dinosaur work is, is exciting work. Um, we're going to take just a minute to answer any questions you might have. We did have one come in, Charlie, as we wait for um, potentially if there are others. Um, and it is about the exhibit. There was a question about that 
you know, the actual life-sized, um, you know, uh, dinosaur that you have um, in the exhibit. And we kind of saw quickly the kind of the two sides of it. And I know just personally, I had a chance to walk through briefly and the, the side of it where you do show the, the breathing and, you know, I mean, and all kind of the insides working. And I know you talked a little bit earlier about how that's an imperfect, you know, science, if you will. But this question basically asks about kind of talking more about what exactly you get to see when you're in the exhibit and you see the actual insides functioning of this dinosaur. Yeah, great question. Um, um, the, the side of the dinosaur where you saw kind of a cutaway version, that's actually a, a screen. It's actually a, a, a movie screen, a, a video screen, and they project bodily functions on that. So it'll show you how respiration happened. And I, I don't think I got to say this because it moved along so quickly, but here's an example. You have one of the largest animals ever to roam the earth. You know, it, it, efficiency, just how much energy does it take just to hold up its neck and tail, right? How is it, how is it able to live just on plants and, and, and how many plants it could get in that little bitty mouth and that, down that long neck? Well, here's an example. In its respiration, and they had the model there, it has lungs. But it also has behind the lungs an air sac. And when it breathes in, it would fill both the lungs and the air sac. And when it breathed out, the, the air from the air sac went into the lungs and gave it more oxygen for its blood. So it actually had that double efficiency of breathing in oxygen, breathing out, here's more oxygen. So it had these efficiencies about it. And that side of the video talks about those efficiencies. It talks about uh, digestion, it talks about uh, uh, egg laying, things like that. And it just shows some videos about how that body may have worked. And again, a lot of what we know about dinosaurs is we use the present as the key to the past, and we have to hypothesize, here's how we think it worked. Uh, and in some cases, they do find some internal organs fossilized. I, I think it's very rare. I don't know for sure. Uh, but these, these are the theories of how these animals work, and it, it is projected on there, and you can hear a narrator talking about those, those body functions. So fascinating. Um, another question that, that came in, uh, uh, another thing that you touched on briefly in the video that I do think is very fascinating is uh, about the eggs of these dinosaurs, and it says, how do we know that so many eggs were laid at one time? and uh, multiple times per year. How, you know, how did we get that information? Wow, you know what? That's the number one question in dinosaur research. How do we know? That's, a, that's just such an insightful question. Thank you for that. And um, well, the fossil record is really our baseline and it's how we know. Uh, we have found clutches of these eggs together and have a sense of, all these eggs together and we've seen the size of them they're relatively very small compared to these huge huge animals and so then again using the present to the key as key to the past we know frogs and toads do very similar things right they lay mountains of these eggs and they might do it more than once a year so uh, so really through the fossil record we have found clutches of these eggs together uh, i have not personally seen a clutch of sauropod eggs. I've seen a big clutch of theropod, the meat eater eggs together, six or eight together in a nest. Uh, I think it was up in Montana, Wyoming, we found hadrosaur nests, which is a meat, which is a grass plant eater. And those eggs are all together like that. Then as far as how do we know they did it multiple times a year, I'm not positive. I think we're just using current animals that do similar things and getting a sense if they don't nurture their young and there's so many born, uh, we hypothesize that they're doing this many times a year, several times per year. That's great. Appreciate that insight, Charlie. Um, those are the two questions we have at the moment. Like Charlie said, if, if you have others, please keep sending those in and uh, I'll let you transition to talk dinosaurs in Texas. Yeah, I got two more things I'm going to do first. First of all, another trivia question, just to make sure you guys are on your toes. Uh, here it is. What dinosaurs lived in Waco during the late Cretaceous period. And the Cretaceous was that very end of the dinosaur age. What dinosaurs lived in Waco at the end of the Cretaceous period? Again, just try your best, put in an answer. Let's see what we, what we come up with. 
Any ideas coming in, Ryan, at all? We, we got one great answer. This, this should be like a, a winner. Uh, and I, hopefully she wouldn't mind if I say her name's Diane. She said, uh, so I can give her a shout out, but she said a, a, a yeehaw source, a source, of course. <laughs> good, good name, good name. The, the one dinosaur I know that's named similar to that, Diane, is called Papasaurus. There really is a Papasaurus. So I'll mention that we need a yeehaw source. Um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about dinosaur names later. Uh, any others coming in? And then I'll give you the answer. Yeah, we had a few others that, that came in. Um, let's see. Uh, we had a, a T-Rex was listed. Uh, we also have uh, one guest that said uh, the, the types of dinosaurs would have lived, lived near the mammoth site is what they said. Um, so yeah, we had a few other comments, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the basic gist of it there, Charlie, and I'll let you, I'll let you kind of a, kind of a trick question, right? It is a trick question, y'all. I'm very sorry, but uh, they gave me a script and I had to ask, ask the question. Um, during the Cretaceous, Waco and most of Texas was underwater. There were inland seas that had advanced over the continental United States. The shoreline for that inland sea was up around Glen Rose, Parker County, Texas, just west of here. So west of here, up towards Glen Rose, we do have dinosaurs, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Here in Waco, underwater, uh, we had marine reptiles, prehistoric reptiles. And by definition, uh, anything that did not walk on land was, things that walked on land were dinosaurs. Prehistoric things in the ocean were not dinosaurs. They were reptiles. So we had things like pliosaurs, mosasaurs, uh, um, um, and plesiosaurs. So if you come to the Mayborn, you can actually see that. Uh, so we had, we had marine reptiles here, and that's where you'll see a lot of fossils here when you come to the Mayborn. So what we want to do now is we were going to show you some of the Mayborn Museum's exhibits and fossils. We're going to be joined uh, in a tape recording by our collections manager, Anita Benedict. Hi, my name is Anita Benedict and I'm the Collections Manager here at the Mayborn Museum. And I'm here today to tell you a little bit about some of the dinosaur and the non-dinosaur fossil material we have in our Cretaceous Sea exhibit and upstairs in our collections. Now, most of Central Texas, uh, the rocks that you see are Cretaceous in age, meaning that they were deposited 119 million to 65 million years ago. They were deposited when the area was covered by an inland sea. Because of that, there actually is very little evidence of dinosaurs. What evidence we do have of dinosaurs in central Texas is predominantly the footprints that they left in the sediments. This footprint uh, is believed to be from Acrocanthosaurus, which was a large sauropod or meat-eating dinosaur that walked uh, in the ancient shorelines up in the Glen Rose Formation about 115 to 105 million years ago. Since most of Central Texas was underwater for so long, most of the rocks contain large numbers of invertebrate fossils, such as clams, oysters, and echinoids. But occasionally there are found vertebrate fossils, such as fish and turtles, or giant swimming reptiles. One group of these swimming reptiles were the plesiosaurs, some of which had long necks and small heads. Others, called pliosaurs, had short necks and big heads. We're still working on preparing the fossil material from our pliosaur. This is a small preparation, preparation lab that we put together here at the Mayborn, which allows us to work on the fossil material and for our visitors to watch and ask questions. Currently, I am working on part of the shoulder blade of this fin from the pliosaur. When I clean this and glue it together, I use dental tools, 
different brushes, a glue called B72, and an air scribe, which allows me to chip off little pieces of the surrounding rock. Now let's head upstairs and look at a few things we have in our collection. Hi, right, so this fossil material is from the jaw of a mosasaur. A mosasaur was another swimming reptile that became the dominant predator after the pliosaurs died out about 90 million years ago. This specimen is from west of Temple, Texas. Uh, as you can see, it has some pretty impressive teeth. And lastly, to bring us back to dinosaurs, we have these two dinosaur eggs. These are not from Central Texas, but they are from China. Uh, they are believed to be from a dinosaur called Protoceratops, um, and which was a herbivorous dinosaur that walked uh, in Southeast China at the same time that Mosasaurs were swimming over Central Texas. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little behind the scenes tour of uh, the material down in Cretaceous Sea and up here in collections. And I hope you'll come visit the Mayborn Museum and see our new exhibit, World's Largest Dinosaur. Thank you, Anita. And uh, just a glimpse into our collections area. Uh, one thing Anita did not go into because we're talking about dinosaurs today, uh, the Mayborn Museum is also the repository for all the fossils from Waco Mammoth National Monument. And the National Monument started as a research project of the Mayborn Museum, which was actually called the Strecker Museum uh, about 20 years ago. And, and, and even 100 years before that, it was called the Baylor University Museum. So this museum has been around a while. Baylor has supported the museum and realizes how important it is to learning and, and uh, bringing new ideas into the community. Um, so uh, we also have many, many drawers full of bones from Waco Mammoth National Monument. And at the preparation area, Anita showed you, I saw this morning, Dr. Lindsay Yan, who's the head paleontologist at Waco Mammoth National Monument. She was here in the museum with one of her interns, summer interns, funded by the National Park Service and the Waco Mammoth Foundation. And they were going to that very prep area Anita showed you, which is on exhibit. You can come by and actually see them and talk with them. So if you're in the Mayborn Museum, there'll be a chance that they'll be here to chat with you a little bit about that. Um, so one more segment, and then we'll answer some more questions. So as questions come in, please put them in your chat. But I wanted to spend a few minutes to talk to you specifically about Texas dinosaurs, because Texas is dinosaur country. So let's queue up that, Kyle, if we can uh, queue up our, our uh, uh, quick slideshow here. So yes, Texas was dinosaur country. Um, a lot of it uh, was on the edge of that inland sea. A lot of our fossil record in central Texas in particular was on the edge of that inland sea that Anita talked about and I talked about earlier. These are some of the animals that were here. You can see Tyrannosaurus. You can see the big sauropods on the right. There's a Velociraptor there. We have found Velociraptor claw claws. And up above is a pterosaur. A pterosaur was a flying reptile. It technically was not a dinosaur, but hey, we put them all together. So yes, Texas was dinosaur country. The first animal uh, that really jumped out at us, uh, and this was 25 years ago, um, was Tonontosaurus. And that's the animal, the big animal in the back you see. Uh, a young boy and his father, who was a science teacher, were walking along a creek in Parker County, Texas, and they came across a skull. And the dad said, well, I think that's a horse skull. And the boy said, his, his young boy said, no, dad, I think it's a dinosaur. So they brought it to the Museum of Science and History, where I was working at the time. Uh, we brought in some paleontologists from SMU because we did not have a research background. We were more of a teaching and exhibiting museum. So we partnered and found out that, yes, lo and behold, this was a Texas dinosaur found right here just west of Fort Worth on the Doss Ranch. Uh, the research showed it as a new species, and guess what? It's called Tyrannosaurus docile. 
And that's how a lot of these animals get their scientific name, either the researcher who discovered it, in this case, very gracious landowners who allowed us to come on their land, excavate this animal. Uh, and it was actually almost 60 to 70% complete. A lot of dinosaur skeletons you'll see are a lot of times only 20% real bone and the rest are casts that they've filled in the blanks, if you will, to show how the animal looked or might have looked. But this animal was 60 to 70% complete. Uh, and it is now on display at the Science and History Museum in Fort Worth. And the little guys in front are called hypsilophodonts. And at Proctor Lake, which is west of here, it's somewhere near Stephenville, right? Proctor Lake, they actually found what they think was a nursery of these young animals, much like uh, Waco mammoth is a nursery herd of mammoths where the young were in the middle surrounded by adults to protect them, but some catastrophic event happened and they died. This happened uh, out at this location near Proctor Lake millions of years ago, and many, many animals died. These little, little guys were probably a, maybe a foot and a half to two feet long. That's, they were dinosaurs, but that's how big they were. All right, what do we have next? Um, so here's the first time I saw a Texas sauropod, a long neck sauropod. And we were asked to come out to a ranch. Uh, and this ranch had been excavated in the 1930s. Uh, and actually some graduate students had crossed a fence illegally, found this animal, excavated a few things, took them back to another university, I won't name, in Austin and um, uh, described this as an animal. They called this pleurocelis. Remember the, the pleuroceles were those air pockets in the neck and they called it pleurocelis. Well, we knew this animal was near Glen Rose. And if you ever have a chance, drive up to Dinosaur Valley State Park. It's a wonderful way to spend the afternoon. It's about uh, an hour, hour and a half here from Waco, about an hour out of Fort Worth to the south. And you can actually see the tracks of this big animal as it went across the muddy bank shoreline uh, of a river and or the ocean at that time. And then the next slide, you can also see the three-toed tracks of this meat eater called, uh, um, oh my goodness, Acrocanthosaurus, which means high-spined lizard. He had these big spines on his back. Um, and it was followed, the three-toed tracks were paralleling the big wash tub tracks of Pleurocelis. So we think that this meat eater was following this uh, uh, herbivore looking for someone who he might be able to attack. And in this painting by Karen Carr, the artist, she, so, she shows the, uh, the Acrocanthosaurus actually attacking the, the Pleurocelis. And I like to think the Pleurocelis got that big old tail and knocked Acrocanthosaurus right off his feet and he got away, but we don't know. Uh, what do we have next? Oh yes, um, so this is a bad photograph and it's from a book. I don't know if you can see me, I'm small, but there's a book called Lone Star Dinosaurs and I recommend it. It's about Texas dinosaurs, Lone Star Dinosaurs. And it has a chapter on the heart of Texas dinosaurs. So what are the dinosaurs here in the middle of Texas? This is a picture from the book. Uh, the author thanks the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History and the director and a curator, but he never thanked me. But in this picture in the book, they don't identify me, but I promise you that gentleman who stooped down working while the other paleontologists are just standing around talking, that's me. And I was able to go on the Jones Ranch. Uh, we spent about nine years on the Jones Ranch excavating pleurocelis uh, bones, fossils. And when we studied them, the scientists at SMU said, you know what, this is not Pleurocelis, it's a new dinosaur. And the, the scientists named it Paluxysaurus Jones Eye. And those of you who know the Glen Rose area where the ranch was, Paluxy River, the Paluxy River is where Dinosaur Valley State Park is. It's where the famous trackway is. You can go up there today and see dinosaur tracks in the water, absolutely. There's, literally probably 1,200 across the park. Many of them are submerged. Some of them are now buried by uh, erosion, but they're there. Uh, Paluxy River, so Paluxy Saurus. And then Jones Eye, because Mr. Jones owned the ranch, Mr. and Miss Jones owned the ranch and allowed us to dig on that property for eight or nine years, donated the fossils to the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, 
and that animals are now on display. You can see it. And what happened at the time, it was such a big deal. We went to the state legislature and said, you know what, this should be the state dinosaur of Texas. And they named Paluxysaurus jones eye the state dinosaur uh, for Texas. But the story does not end there because I went to Glen Rose about a month ago and I found out, wait a minute, they've renamed it. So let's go to the next slide. And this talks a little bit about dinosaur science. So when I was first introduced to this animal, this long neck sauropod here in Texas, it was called Pleurocelis back in 1995. That's what we called it, Pleurocelis, based on some fossils that were actually found up in Maryland. And these look like those same fossils. So the scientists said, yes, it's Pleurocelis. Well, then the Museum of Science and History and SMU dug into that. We found new fossils. We found more fossils. We studied those fossils. And we named it Paluxysaurus jones eye. And that, that's an animal they estimated at 20 tons, 70 feet long, 12 feet high. Well, guess what? Another scientist looked at those bones and said, no, 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 you're all wrong. These are the same bones that were described earlier and called Sora Poseidon. And if you go to Glen Rose uh, Dinosaur Valley Park right now, they'll say this animal is called Sora Poseidon because that's what the current science thinks. Uh, I spoke with the scientists who had named it Pleurocelis, and they said, oh, we think it's going to come back and be called uh, Paluxysaurus. I'm sorry, I talked to the scientists who named it Paluxysaurus. They think it's going to come back, and they think they have proof that it's its own species, and it's not Sora Poseidon. But if it is Sora Poseidon, you can see it's a lot bigger than we thought, up to 112 feet long, not just 70 feet long, up to 50 tons. So this animal did wander through Texas. Uh, we're not sure exactly how science is an ever evolving thing, uh, but we know there were some amazing animals here and we're still studying those. So that's our overview. It talked about our new exhibit and a little bit about the uh, museum in New York. It came from a little bit of behind the scenes here at the Mayborn and then a little bit more about Texas dinosaurs. I had the opportunity and I still have the opportunity to go out and do excavations periodically. So it's been just the highlight of my life, frankly, to go out and be part of these excavations. So let's wrap up and just see if there's any more questions uh, uh, and see what we might have, Ryan. I did have one, Charlie. I received actually via text message, one of our guests that's, that's tuning in uh, texted me and, and you know, basically complimented how uh, you know, your kind of your interest and in, in your description of all of this. And they asked, basically, I wonder, you know, what it was that got Charlie so interested in, you know, in this type of study and, and, you know, so what, so take us back to kind of what, what got you first involved in all of this. All right. Uh, all right. I'm going to do this. Just give me one second. So guys, when I was in fifth grade, I took a museum class. I found this fossil when I was in fifth grade. This is an ammonite. It's a marine fossil. You can find them all over this area. If you go up to Lake Whitney, they're all around the lake. And I found this one with permission from the landowner. So I took a geology class at a museum when I was a young kid. I found this fossil and uh, uh, I've had it with me ever since. So I was just fascinated by this. And part of it though, I'll tell you, uh, this fossil was embedded in a bigger rock and I was a little kid trying to drag this thing back to the van and I looked up at the teacher who, who was a teacher at the museum and, he, and I said can I can I bring this home and he said anything you can carry into that van you can bring home and it just was such a free uh, uh, there was such a freedom in that statement because a lot of people are told what they can do and what they need to learn in this case the the museum educator said, hey, if you're interested in it, grab it. That's important. So I got hooked on an early age. I have other fossils in my office that uh, I've been able to collect over the years. Uh, and I just had that spark early on. And of course, right, dinosaurs. How do you not love dinosaurs? They're, they, they walk this earth. They're amazing animals. And, uh, uh, and they're real. So uh, it's just been fun to learn about them. And of course, um, I've kept that passion going now for many, many years, and uh, uh, I still love getting out in the field. And whenever I still <laughs> am walking along the river bank and I see something, I'll pick it up and go, oh my gosh, that is an amazing fossil. And I'll, uh, I'll either leave it now for the next person to find, or if I have permission from the landowner, I, I'll bring it in and keep it. I, I do not have a room full of dinosaur bones or fossils. I, you can count my fossils on your 
on your toes and your fingers. I'll put it that way. I do have some cool ones though. No, that's, that's great. Um, love your passion for it and, and, and all of that. Um, here's a, here's a, a nice kind of segue, I guess, from, from all that you just shared with us. Um, the, an, an attendee did ask uh, if you have a favorite dinosaur or also a favorite fun fact about, you know, a certain dinosaur or, or something like that. Wow. No, that's a great, great question. Um, short answer is no. I love all dinosaurs. As far as a fun fact, um, we found six new species of dinosaurs within an hour of Waco, Texas. They're here, but they're very, very rare. Uh, out at the mammoth site, right? You have mammoths that were um, fossilized and they've been there since about 65,000 years ago. Well, guess what? Dinosaurs left us 65 million years ago. So when you uncover a fossil uh, from a dinosaur, uh, it's like a buried treasure. It's something that's millions and millions of years old and nobody's ever seen it. You're the first. So I've had that opportunity to be the one who discovered those fossils. And that's what's most special, most special to me. The diversity of dinosaurs are amazing. Um, in Texas, uh, in addition to coming to the Mayborn, we have wonderful museums. The Perot Museum actually lent the Mayborn a T-Rex skeleton. We, had, we now have a T-Rex skeleton. It's an amazing animal. It's a, it's a cast. Uh, but it's in our lobby here. But if you want to see more dinosaurs from Texas, Perot Museum, the Whitty Museum, Houston Museum of Natural Science, all have great dinosaurs. Fort Worth Museum has great Texas dinosaurs. So, you know, go out and see them. Uh, they're, uh, they're very rare. They're very rare. And uh, uh, each fossil has a wonderful story to tell. And it's just a piece of a puzzle. And as you can tell from that name game for Pleurocelis, no, it's Pelexisaurus, no, it's Sora Poseidon. Science is always studying and trying to figure out where these things, who, what they are and how they fit into each other. So you've given us a lot of great recommendations on you know, sites to visit, museums, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there was one question that came in uh, specifically, it asks if you have any movies that you recommend, you know, about dinosaurs, but I would also kind of expand and say, perhaps um, documentaries or, or, you know, things like that, that would showcase some of the work you've talked about. Yes. Um, short answer is yes. Um, I can't name a title right now. Um, there have been on the Discovery, the Discovery Channel has some great dinosaur documentaries. And I think the best thing would be just to Google dinosaur documentaries. Um, we made some in New Mexico at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science, specifically about the dinosaurs we were excavating there. Um, um, the best thing I would do is go to a few museum websites and they'll have some other resources for you as well. But I think Discovery is, has a, an ongoing, and I've talked to paleontologists who have had specials. There was a recent one that PBS did, it was called the Dinosaur Road Trip, and I can recommend that. Uh, it was an educator from the Field Museum, and it was a three-part special called Dinosaur Road Trip. It aired uh, two summers ago, or maybe it was last summer, and this person grew up in South Dakota, and there's wonderful dinosaur, in, dinosaur fossils in South Dakota, and she wanted to go home and then explore South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, that area, North Dakota, and she meets paleontologists, takes you to museums. So check that out on PBS, Dinosaur, uh, Dinosaur Road Trip. Uh, recommend that one. Last, uh, last question, Charlie, I'll throw at you and then we'll wrap up uh, just to be respectful of everybody's lunch hour. But um, we did have another question about um, kind of dinosaur eggs, and I'm not sure how much you'll be able to you know, speak to it, but it asked about um, it, it says, how long does it take for a dinosaur egg to hatch? I'm guessing, you know, that would probably vary from, from species to species, but, uh, and then it also asks, uh, how many of the dinosaurs are actually hatched, you know, via egg? I'm guessing they mean versus those that might be, you know, more of a, you know, more of a, a natural birth that we would think of with. Right. Animals. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. I, I, dinosaurs is a group of animals were egg layers. So they laid eggs. Dinosaurs laid eggs. Uh, I'm sure it varied on size. I can tell you in Texas, the only eggs we have found are down near Big Bend. They found little scrappy pieces of shell. 
And to, for something to be fossilized, you know, it's, it's subject to immense pressure and time and, and thin things like skulls and eggs, they tend to get crunched and pulverized a bit more than you saw the big long bones. So it is, it is unusual for eggs to be fossilized, but they have found them. I mentioned up in Montana and some places and many, many dinosaur eggs have come out of China. They've just found some places. The conditions were just right that it wasn't too much pressure that just crushed the eggs and slowly mineralized. And you can see these eggs from there. Uh, but again, the present is the key to the past. So look at egg layers today, see how long it takes eggs to incubate. And then, you know, it would be something similar uh, for dinosaurs. It could be a lot longer given the animals are so much bigger, uh, but that's the place to start. Well, that's fantastic. And um, Charlie, again, to you and to Kyle and also to uh, Rebecca Null that's on your team that couldn't be here today, but the three of you were um, you know, essential to making this happen. So I wanted to thank you for your time and for your excitement and, and insight. And, um, and, and hopefully we can get, get these attendees out to come visit you at the, at the Mayborn here in the next month or so. Well, I want to thank you and Tess, Ryan, and all of our alumni. You know, we greatly appreciate your, uh, your support. And we'll do it again sometime, Ryan. How about that? Yes, that sounds fantastic. We'll talk to you soon. And and to everybody that's tuning in today, again, thank you for your contribution to the Mayborn Museum as a part of signing up. Thanks for being here for the event. We will send a uh, post-event email. And one note about that post-event email is we are going to put a link to allow you to join the uh, or to, re to receive the newsletter from the Mayborn Museum. So make sure you click that link and sign up to get all the updates on the things that are happening uh, in Waco around the Mayborn Museum. So with that being said, we'll wrap up. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, certainly enjoy your weekend as well. We'll see you next time.